a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Conrad Elst. He's a well-known scholar who has written extensively on comparative religions, Hindu-Muslim Muslim relations, etc. His book, Ram Janbhumi vs. Babri Masjid, a case study in Hindu-Muslim conflict, is very well known. Then he has written another book, Dr. Ambedkar, a true Aryan. There's another one who is a Hindu. And then, of course, the well-known decolonizing the Hindu mind. So this is Buddhism session four. Dr. Thank you. OK. Uh, as you see in the program, the uh, title was The uh, Buddha versus Sheldon Pollock. But in this case, uh, I have decided that, um, you know, when attentively reading his uh, relevant <coughs> writings, that in fact he is entirely representative of uh, near consensus throughout Indology. And so in a sense, you see, here we're not criticizing his own personal contribution, but rather that consensus that stretches across the Indological world. So most of them, along with the Indian Ambedkarites and secularists, you know, shout out that Hinduism bad, Buddhism good. You see, that is the framework that always uh, explains the, uh, any, anything pertaining to the relations between the Buddha and Hinduism. It is, for instance, said Hinduism is the problem, Buddhism the solution. It is said that Hinduism is selfish and Buddhism is compassionate. You see, this has to do with the um, famous Buddhist concept of anatta or anatman, no self, which I think is a big mistake, but that's not what my talk here is about. Uh, but anyway, uh, so there is arguably a certain difference of opinion, uh, or at least a difference of views in words between Atman in the Upanishads versus Anatta or Anatman in Buddhism. And so leading Buddhist scholars like uh, Richard Gombrich, whom I think is at the moment the leading Buddha scholar in the world, um, he interprets these Upanishadic passages about the self as uh, a justification of selfishness. You know, like when Yajna Valkya says to his wife, uh, not because of the wife is the wife beloved, but because of the self. You see, he takes that to mean uh, the instrumentalization of the wife. You know, I don't love you, I only use you because I love myself. You know, you know so, so, some people interpret it like that, and that way, of course, it is very easy to put Hinduism in the dock. Buddhism is, of course, uh, the antidote to Hindu casteism and oppressiveness. And further, um, Buddhism is not superstitious like Hinduism. Then, of course, uh, Hindus tend to um, reply by pointing to points in common. And when you look from the outside, there are very many things in common. Uh, you know, when you look at this funny world, like here in Delhi, you know, there are certain Tibetan places. And uh, as a foreigner, you can't really make out the difference. You know, they both say mantras and they have these uh, malas and, you know, uh, so it, from outside, it looks the same. Um, and so, you know, Hindus, of course, know more about it. But, you know, their defensive explanation is that, well, yeah, but Buddhism influenced Hinduism. Well, you know, I think that is not good enough. But anyway, that is widely said, and that is also admitted by the Indologists. Yes, of course, Buddhism influenced Hinduism. Indeed, Whenever there is anything positive in Hinduism, it must be because of Buddhist influence. Because Hinduism is 100% evil, and so when there is something good, then it must have been non-Hindu originally. And by contrast, Hinduism has also influenced Buddhism. If you can find anything bad about Buddhism, it must be the corrupting influence from Hinduism. Uh, gifts from Buddhism are many. Uh, for example, and this is a, a specific uh, point that you know Pollock is not alone with, but that he 
uh, has developed um, is the gift of Sanskrit. You know, Buddhism is an important factor in the um, use of Sanskrit as a literary as well as as a political language. Um, it is, he also says, or no, other people say, you know, Indologists say, and this is an ongoing discussion right now, um, you know, where does the adoption of Sanskrit within Buddhism come from? Uh, Pollock himself says that he doesn't know. But so uh, other people like Bronkhorst um, say that um, it was in fact a gift from the foreigners to Indians. You see when the Indo-Greeks like uh, Milinda, Menander, or the um, Kushanas like uh, Kanishka, when they invaded India, uh, you know, they found it uh, difficult, you know, which dialect to learn, you know, whereas Sanskrit already had the status of a universal language, so they adopted Sanskrit. You know, that way they could more or less everywhere find a certain intro. Uh, so, you know, that is possible. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, then, you know, the ideas of the Upanishads, you might think, are very profound. Well, you see, they are nothing more than a clumsy adaptation that cannot hide the natural Hindu selfishness and other evils. But nevertheless, an adaptation borrowed from Buddhist thought. Now, this is chronologically a little bit impossible, but nevertheless, some Indologists actually uh, try the exercise of showing that somehow the Upanishads are later than the Buddha. Like uh, Christian Wedemeyer, for example, or especially Johannes Bronckhorst. And um, against that, the earlier mentioned uh, Richard Gombrich defends himself. He says, the Buddha cannot possibly have quoted uh, from the Upanishads if they didn't already exist, which seems obvious to me. Um, Michael Witzel, for example, also a bit of a hate figure among uh, Hindus, uh, argues similarly that it is impossible to date the Upanishads as younger than the Buddha. So in, in, in this respect, you see, he is with you. Um, a very different matter, the institution of the universities. You see, now that there is a sort of attempt to revive Nalanda University, uh, without, of course, ever saying how it ended in 1193. Um, you know, the impression um, should be discussed, you know, whether universities are a Buddhist contribution. You see, they seem so, but in fact, well, I'll say what the fact is. Uh, just a minute first, of course, the anti-caste um, stance is now deemed typical of Buddhism, which was a revolutionary social movement against the Vedic oppressiveness. So there are two things wrong with this picture. Uh, the claims that are being made for Buddhism are mostly untrue, but even more importantly, I think, the framework that is being used, namely that there are two religions meeting each other halfway and then influencing each other, that is totally misconceived. You see, you can say, well, you know, Hinduism originated here and Islam originated somewhere else, and they met each other halfway and they influenced or they interacted at any rate. You know, maybe it took the form of destruction or maybe it took the form of Sufi adaptations or whatever, you know, but they interacted after they met, you know, because originally they existed separately. Now, in the case of the relation between Buddhism and Hinduism, this is totally untrue. So instead, and I think we should put it in these terms, Buddhism originated as one of the many sects within the Hindu commonwealth. And so that's how you should see it. The Buddha was a Hindu, um, and you know anything that is to be said about Buddhism is similar in nature to whatever can be said about other Hindu sects. So different, but you know, of the same order of difference as the different other sects of Hinduism are different from each other. Of course, as it happens, it is the most successful sect of Hinduism. You know, it became a world religion in its own right. But still, you know, this is where it originates. So the claims are untrue. Well, yes, you see, um, 
about uh, court Sanskrit. Um, so it is said that the foreigners felt more at home with Sanskrit because it was already a universal language rather than with any of the local dialects. Yes, but that is the same consideration as any Indian would have. You see, when Buddhism uh, evolved and was a few centuries old and had already spread in a large part of India, of course, Buddhists would notice that there was a language problem. You see, in, in areas they spoke different dialects that also changed. Then they went to the south when they spoke completely different languages. And so it would have been helpful if they had an international medium. The same thing you have, by the way, in Jainism. You see, in Jainism, that started with Ardha Magadhi, the local vernacular. Yet, you see, many books within Jainism have been written in Sanskrit. You know, because Sanskrit has its advantages. And so, as long as we don't find any reason that points to a decidedly different factor, you know, I think here we should settle for the most logical explanation that Sanskrit was adopted because it was the universal language. The same reason why we are speaking English right now. Um, and Pali, you know, some secularists like the late Rajni Kothari, you know, write in defense of Pali and against Sanskrit. Well, you know, Pali has a historical relevance and some people should study it. Nevertheless, Pali was not a universal language. You know, nobody understands Pali today. And it was not the language of the Buddha. You know, the argument, oh yeah, we should get as close to the original as possible. Well, that doesn't work, you know. Pali was written in a different region and three, two, three hundred years later. Well, dialects had evolved. So it was definitely not the language of the Buddha. So there is no particular reason to stick to Pali. Whereas Sanskrit, you know, you can go places with. Um, the few Buddhist courts that we know of, especially Ashokas, did not introduce Sanskrit. Um, and um, moreover, there is another um, scenario that Hind Indologists have thought up to explain why Buddhists adopted Sanskrit. It is that, um, you know, the courts adopted Sanskrit gradually as a political language and therefore to negotiate you know, for the interests of their own monasteries. You know, monks had to go to the court once in a year or something and negotiate in Sanskrit. Well, that's very interesting, but, you know, first of all, they had Sanskrit-speaking people among them. You know, 40% or so were Brahmins to start with. Um, and then anyway, you see, if, if you have a few people who can do this job one day a year, that's no reason to change your whole you know, linguistic system. So you see, that's, it's all not very convincing. You see, the logical explanation is that they adopted Sanskrit because it was easier to use Sanskrit. And then, of course, every monk has the freedom to translate his knowledge into the local language whenever he's giving a sermon, which is what Hindu preachers also do. You see, they say, yeah, well, the Gita says this, then they quote a Sanskrit shloka, and then they go on in Hindi. You know, this... All very natural. But you see, people make a living thinking up alternative scenarios. Um, there are a number of quotations by the Buddha from the Upanishads. Uh, this is not said in so many words, you see. The Buddha didn't speak using footnotes. So you see, there are no exact references. But what is more, something typically Hindu happened. And, you know, it's not the best side of Hinduism, but I think you will admit that it is there. Um, Hindus are very sectarian. I first noticed this in the West. Followers of gurus, you know, they only know their own guru and nothing else. And so, you see, when the guru quotes from, um, from the Rig Veda, Ekam Sad Vipra Bahudha Vadanti, um, then you see they all... You know, on their Facebook page, you know, they all contact each other. Hey, the guru said something very profound. Hey, come, Satvi. You know, well, the guru didn't say that. The Rig Veda said it. You know, Sir Dirgha Tamas said it 4,000 years ago. And so, similarly, you see, the Buddha 
brings up some phrase from the Brahadaraya Upanishad, and mostly his own pupils don't even know that. And certainly two, three hundred years later, when Buddhism has become a big establishment, they all look up to the Buddha and they don't look beyond him. Um, so Buddhist ideas are uh, already present in the Upanishads. I don't need to go into detail. But for example, the condemnation of desire, the identification of desire as a source of problem, the concept of liberation that is already there. Um, the idea of fellow feeling or compassion is not as um, stressed, as emphasized in the Upanishads, but it's very much there. And even, you know, one thing that is always brought up as a proof of how Buddhism is different from Vedic religion, which, by the way, is a far smaller thing than the very large concept of Hinduism. Um, you see, even that so-called rejection of the Vedas is already Vedic. You see, in the uh, Upanishads, it is already repeatedly said, yeah, you know, this ritualism, these sacrifices and so on is nice, but that's not it. You know, what we need is knowledge, we need is jnana, and so, you know, in fact, everybody who studies the Vedas has heard of the division between karma kanda and jnana kanda. So, you know, the Buddha could not invent this, it was already there. And then, um, his meditation exercises are largely already of Hindu stock, and it is said very explicitly, even in the Pali Canon itself, that he learned meditation from two Sankhya teachers whose meditation techniques are the two most advanced stages in Buddhist meditation. So it's not like he discarded them. This is often said in textbooks. He discarded them in disgust, and then he developed his own thing. No. You see, he built on what he had learned. And then maybe he added some newly invented technique, you know, vipassana or so, uh, but still, you know, he built on what, whatever Hindus gave him. As for the Buddhist university, two of the Buddha's own friends were, had been students at Takshashila University. So this existed already before he was born. So the university is a Vedic invention, not a Buddhist one. Uh, as for egalitarianism, uh, the Buddha himself was, of course, an elite figure par excellence absolutely elite figure. You see, at 20 years, he was a member of the Senate of the Shakya Republic. He was the son of the president for life of the Shakya Republic. He was a Kshatriya. He was tall and white-skinned. That's how he is described. Uh, so he was, you know, by Nazi definition, he was an Aryan. Can't help it. Um, so, you know, all the Buddhist philosophers are Brahmins. The Buddha himself was a Kshatriya. Um, Maitreya, the next Buddha, is predicted to be a Brahmin. You see, whenever he talks about Arya, he means upper caste. He means either Kshatriya or Brahmin. Um, his ashes is a, a very significant detail. When he dies, he's cremated and his ashes, you know, are up for use as a relic. And so eight different cities demand the ashes, or at least their share of the ashes. And the argument they use is, you know, tells it all. They say, he was a Kshatriya, we are Kshatriyas. Therefore, we are entitled to his ashes. Now, the fact that they are casteist does not prove that the Buddha was. But still, you see, 45 years after the Buddha started his preaching, it is still perfectly normal to talk, cast this talk in a specifically, uh, in, in a Buddhist context par excellence. So you see, they might have thought that, but if, if Buddhist, Buddhism was so anti-casteist, then certainly they would have couched it in different arguments. Uh, the order has its dirty work performed by others. You see, that is of course also why um, the Buddha was so successful. He, um, he was an elite person and he knew all the elite people. So what happened is that, you know, they wanted to donate something, you know, they wanted to do something pious. So what could they do as kings? 
you know, they collected taxes, either money from merchants or, you know, from laborers, they collected labor. You know, one month a year or something, you had to do labor for your Lord. And so the king said, okay, you know, whatever you do, you go build a monastery for my favorite monk. And so that's how Buddhism got institutionalized. And by the time he died, there was a big network of monasteries, which no other sect could boast of. And that then attracted more people, even talented people, who made Buddhism into a very nice doctrine, an attractive doctrine that could conquer the world. Um, anyway, so in every country, Buddhism adapted to whatever social structure existed. You know, in Japan, it was, uh, you know, military feudalism. In China, it was imperial bureaucracy, whatever. Uh, and that's normal, because, you know, if you have to work for achieving your own desires, that is already difficult enough, and for many people it never happens. They don't succeed, but some people at least succeed. Some people are happy, are rich, and so on, it happens. But if you dream of transforming society, creating a utopia, you know, then you are gone forever. And when, when will you meditate? So for people who are <laughs> devoted to meditation, this is all silly. You know, another proof of his non-egalitarianism is, of course, his treatment of women. You know, I mean, it, it may be right or wrong. I, I'm not saying anything about the contents, but at any rate, he clearly put women lower. No doubt about it. Okay, so it is very unhistorical to speak of Hinduism and Buddhism. You know, it is like creationists who say that God, 6,000 years ago, created the world and created every species at the same time. You know, dinosaurs and elephants and human beings, they all coexisted at the same time. You know, that is this. Um, and yet it is a Western way of looking at it, you know, whereas it is Indians who are reputed to have no sense of history. Um, so the Indologist narrative essentially is a projection from the Bible, even though few people know that, um, because they have this idea of prophecy. You see, the Buddha received it all from God or from somewhere, but at any rate, not from his surroundings. And then he started a revolution against his surroundings. And so this Hindu civilization built up over thousands of years by thousands of people, millions of people, you know, is on a par with the inventions of a single person. Um, so, now, Rice Davids, uh, 19th century, or yeah, about 1900, um, Buddhologist, made a comparison uh, with, yes, with um, Luther. Um, and it's a, it's a familiar pattern in Christian history. First, you have Moses, who overthrows the polytheists. Then you have Jesus, who overthrows Judaic law. Then you have Luther, who overthrows Catholicism, the papacy, priestcraft, you know, ritualism, you know, it's all Catholic stuff that was overthrown by Luther. And so similarly, that's what the Buddha was vis-a-vis -vis Hinduism. So if perforce we have to admit that the Buddha started as a Hindu, then at least he was a rebel against Hinduism. Now, um, so in reality, he was simply a Hindu. Um, he grows up in a Hindu frame of reference, does all kinds of Hindu things, like he goes to the forest to practice asceticism, like many had done before him. He meets other ascetics in the forest. You know, it is among existing ascetics that he recruits his first disciples, and so on. So it was all already there. And so, as we say, uh, after Isaac Newton, you know, he could see that far because he stood on the shoulder of giants. Um, well, let's say quickly here that um, the word Hindu originally means an Indian pagan. Hmm? That's how the Muslims brought the term into India. And so, without even discussing anything whatsoever about his doctrine, his message, and so on, by that token alone, he certainly was a Hindu. You know, and he was not a Muslim, and he was not a Christian. Um, and so the difference between, 
you know, Buddhism and other Hindu sects is not at all like the difference with Islam or with Christianity as they try to make it out to be. Um, so you see sometimes for diplomatic reasons, you know, if you're talking to a Chinese or something, you know, you can say, okay, Hindus and Buddhists as two different religions, you know. Uh, but, you know, among ourselves, you know, let's just be candid and say the Buddha was a Hindu, Bas. Um, yeah, many of his concepts are straight from the Vedas, like the concept of Arya. You know, Arya does not mean simply noble, like Subramaniam Swami said at the, at the beginning. You see, that's a common assumption, and that there is a, a measure of truth in it. But originally, in Vedic times, it meant us, as against them. And so the Paurava tribe that created the Vedas, you know, they also used the word Arya in the sense of our fellow tribesmen. But you see, other people heard this associated with the Vedas, and then it came to mean Vedic, people initiated into the Vedic tradition. And that was reserved for the upper caste, so it came to mean upper caste. And then you have the same development as in English with the word noble. Originally, it means upper class, and then it gets a moral meaning of, you know, noble, magnanimous, and so on. So it's just that. Um, in the Nasa Diya Sukta, the name Na-a-sat, not not being, you know, shows a typical thought form that you find in the Buddha's sermons all the time. You know, uh, you know, God exists and God does not exist. Uh, you know, uh, I am not saying that God exists, nor that he does not exist, nor that he does exist and does not exist, nor that he neither exists nor non-exists. You know, that, 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 that framework, you know, that is already there in the Vedas. Or the concept of Indra Jala, Indra's net, title of one of uh, Malhotra's books. You know, that's from the Atharva Veda, though nowadays, in Western books at least, it is always introduced as Buddhist. Um, you know, Buddhism spread the Vedic gods. As far as Japan, you find temples for Indra and Saraswati, um, and so on. Now, a last point I want to make. Um, and this then is specifically about Pollock. You see, uh, as we discussed in the, the conference last year, um, Pollock goes very far in uh, demonizing Hinduism by claiming that the essence of the national socialist doctrine was Hindu pure and simple. You know, he calls it Brahminic, he calls it Mimansa. He says, uh, Nazism is nothing but applied Mimansa. Now, you see, very many Indologists are anti-Hindu, but this really takes the cake. You know, I mean, in America, where absolute evil is identified with National Socialism, you cannot demonize anyone worse than by saying his, you know, is the essence of Nazism. Um, now, it might, you know, for that reason, interest him to know that his view of the Buddha is entirely the Nazi view of the Buddha. Of course, most Nazis had never heard of the Buddha or didn't care. But you see, a few Orientalists, uh, already since the 19th century, were developing this Nazi framework, this Nazi, uh, or at least this racist view of the world, uh, with the concept of Aryan as of pure race. And you know, of that current, Pollock tries to argue, oh, you know, that is Hindu. And the solution for that is the Buddha. You know, he is, you know, always the, the answer. Now, even in, in the work where he argues this, he quotes a number of Nazi-minded or racist-minded Indologists. And yet, you see, in these quotations, no Mimansaka or other Hindu is ever mentioned. Whereas the Buddha is mentioned again and again and again. And, you know, this is logical. Because precisely those Orientalists had this idea of, you know, Hinduism darkness and Buddhism light. You know, as I told you already, physically he was light, you know, he was white. Um, but he was, to, to the Nazis, the inheritor of the pure Arya um, doctrine, of the pure Aryan culture that had been imported into India by the Aryan invaders. And of course, Pollock and most Indologists defend the Aryan invasion. 
And then you see his uh, pure Aryan ideology was being corrupted by these silly, superstitious, ritualist natives represented by the Brahmin caste. So you see, the roles are a bit reversed here, but the formula of the Buddha as a great dragon slayer opposing all these vicious uh, Brahmins, that's very much there. Uh, so, so it is time to finish. You know, we agree on this, it is time to finish. Um, because, you know, this uh, politicized Buddha, whether in an Aryanist sense pioneered by the Nazis, or in a social justice warrior sense pioneered by Pollock, you see, that must be over. You see, the Buddha did not deal with politics. Whenever he was asked for his opinion on politics, he gave a very moderate answer, had nothing to do with Nazism, had nothing to do with the type of neo ambedkarism that you now find in India. And so, you know, he wanted to go back to meditation, and maybe that's what we all should do once in a while. Thank you. So, uh, my name is Hemant Naidu. What was the Buddha's attitude towards manual labor, especially since the monks would be too busy to take care of day-to-day uh, -day routine tasks? Yes, well, too busy, of course, is a relative notion. You know, people who are lazy, they always say that they are too busy. Um, so, I don't know. You see, like Christian Benedictine monks, they had this formula, ora et labora, pray and work. And they built their own monasteries, and you know, they made large tracts of land fit for agriculture and so on. They, they produced cheese, they produced wine, beer, and so on. Um, so you don't have to do that much, but at least, you know, do your own manual labor that, that, that you know, would make sense. Well, they didn't. Um, of course, you know, they had to go begging every morning. That is one thing they did. But you see, the uh, manual labor was mostly done by manual laborers. And so that was done either because of some, some magnate who donated this labor from his own stock of people paying their taxes through labor, uh, or in fact, in some cases, through slavery. Monasteries had slaves. You know, in China, this is recorded. Uh, so, you know, to speak of egalitarianism becomes very difficult in those circumstances. Okay. Yeah, uh, so I just have uh, two questions over here. Uh, sorry, yeah, just one question over here. Now you talked about the Nasadiya Sukta and I found that very interesting. Uh, in your opinion, is it possible that the Jains invented their logic based on the Nasadiya Sukta? Just a thought. Well, the Nasadiya Sukta is, of course, only one example of a thought form that existed. You know, somebody lives in a certain culture and the ideas that are in the air, at one point he, you know, uses them in the poem he is writing. And, you know, all that culture and so on that was around him that dies. But thousands of years later, we still have that poem. So, you know, now you see that idea only at work in the Nasadiya Sukta. Uh, you know, it was more widespread. And there, of course, it may also have influenced the uh, Jain tradition, yes. To help me, you can do two things. You can go to the subscribe button on my YouTube and subscribe. We need more subscribers there. Uh, secondly, I get lots of emails on people saying, how do we donate? How can we help you? Uh, you go to rajimalhotra.com or you go to infinityfoundation.com and you can hit the donate button. You can donate in dollars. There are different ways mentioned. If you want to donate in rupees, there is a column called uh, Infinity Foundation India and you click that and there are instructions on how you can donate in India.